Hey, how's it going? If you're a new OSRS player or interested in getting started, then this video is for you because I'm going to try to cover all the most important things a new player should know. Whether you're brand new to the game or if you played in the 2000s and you're coming back to experience that childhood nostalgia, you have picked the greatest game ever created. I've been playing consistently since 2005, so hopefully that qualifies me to give advice. As a disclaimer, this video is more about covering the fundamentals, so rather than giving you a checklist of things to do in-game, I'm going to be giving you the knowledge to help you make the best decisions for yourself based on what you enjoy and what you want out of the game. I was originally going to call this video something like X number of tips for new OSRS players, but now that I've recorded most of the video, I'm coming back around to finish up the intro, and I've realized there's way way too many tips to try numbering them throughout the whole video, so instead I'm calling this more of like a general new player's guide. I'll still figure out some way to categorize different sections of the video, so I'll have some kind of organized list of timestamps in the description. But with that said, let's get started and I'll try my best to help you get adjusted into the world of old school RuneScape. The first information you need to know is that the game you played as a kid, RuneScape, is now called RuneScape 3. This version of the game, Old School RuneScape, is a different game that split off in 2013. It's made by the same company, Jagex, so while you can use your same login information from years ago if you remember it, you'll still be starting a brand new character like everyone else had to do in 2013. But you're really not missing out on much because the hundreds and hundreds of hours you may have played as a kid, new players in RS3 can surpass all those levels you had in probably an hour. Old School was created from a backup of the game from 2007, and the goal since 2013 has been to reset everything to 2007 and take the game in a much better direction rather than the way RuneScape 3 went that doesn't involve microtransactions and evolving the combat system. So I guess the first tip here was to not stress about having to start over. The game is very, very different than it was in 2013 when we started with that 2007 backup. There's been an insane amount of updates over the last 10 years, 10 plus years, but at its core, it's still the same game that we know and love. The next tip, and this is huge, is use the old school RuneScape wiki. Go to the website osrs.wiki and bookmark this. There's even an in-game link to the wiki. That's how integrated this is to the game. Everything on here is extremely detailed and meticulously kept up by an outstanding wiki team. We are seriously so lucky to have them, and this is easily the best overall resource you could ever have for the game. Navigating the wiki. What are the most important parts of the wiki for a new player? I'd say the most important section is the skill training guides. You can sort them by free to play or members methods and you pick a skill and it'll show you the different methods you can do for whatever level bracket you want. Another important section for new players is money making methods. Again, you can sort by free to play or members or the type of method like combat or skilling or sort by amount of profit per hour and so on. And it shows all the requirements you need to do that method. I'll be referencing the wiki a lot more throughout the video, so we're gonna move on to the next thing which is the client, RuneLight. You want to play on RuneLight. Jagex, the company behind the game, have their own Jagex launcher, and when you open up the launcher, you choose the game, OSRS or RuneScape 3, your character, and what client you want to play on. Jagex works very closely with RuneLight, and they've integrated it into their launcher. If you use your old account information, you may not be forced to use the Jagex launcher, at least as of the time of recording this. In that case, you can download RuneLight as a standalone client. There's so many phishing sites when you Google it though, so the best way to make sure you're not downloading malicious software is to go to the OSRS website, and they have the link on the front Front page to the official RuneLight website that you can trust. The plugins on RuneLight make the game so much better. When you're starting out, most of them won't make sense, and it can be very overwhelming seeing all these plugins that you have no idea what they do. Just know that that's normal and that's okay. You learn everything about this game as you go, and over time everything will fall into place and you slowly build up your repertoire of knowledge as time goes on. All the plugins built into RuneLight are approved and allowed by Jagex, so don't worry, you won't get banned for using any feature of RuneLight. Eventually, when you understand the game more, you'll find extra plugins from the plugin hub that you'll want to install. These are also all manually approved, so you won't get banned for those either. There's a disclaimer because there's a small chance that some of these could cause 
cause minor bugs, but that's extremely rare and generally most plugins in the plugin hub won't cause any issues. There's plenty of videos on YouTube explaining the best Runelite plugins to utilize, so if you're interested, it might be worth a search. There is one plugin though I do need to give a special shout out to, which is the 117 HD plugin. If you like the HD look, then install this one from the plugin hub, and there is a ton of settings to get the game to look exactly how you want it to. Next tip is familiarize yourself with the rules. You can find them at the bottom of the OSR's website, and they're written in pretty clear language. It's not a bunch of lawyer mumbo jumbo, it's genuinely there because they want you to understand what is and isn't allowed. I've heard this a lot where new players play the game for the first time and get banned because they didn't realize auto clicking was against the rules, or they bought gold from a website that the bot was spamming in the GE and they didn't know that wasn't allowed. Most of the rules I think are self-explanatory and pretty common sense, but those are the main two that I think may not be necessarily intuitive for new players. So it's don't bot. If you don't know what botting is, it's using third-party software to play the game for you and don't real world trade to buy gold or accounts or anything. It's more fun making your way through the game without cheating anyways, because I mean at that point, why are you even playing if you don't want to play? So now you've got the Jagex launcher installed, you hop onto Runelite, make your way through that nostalgic tutorial island, but before you finish, you have the option if you want to play in Iron Man mode. If you lock yourself as an Iron Man, that means you can't trade other players. You have to earn all your items yourself, and you'll get an Iron Man badge next to your name to show everyone else that you're better than them. You'll also be on the separate Iron Man high scores along with the normal high scores. You'll still be in the same world with all the other players though. It's like a single player game mode in a multiplayer game atmosphere. And you'll still be able to take on all the raids and some bosses too with other players and you'll be able to claim your share of the loot. The other variations of Iron Man you could choose are Hardcore, which means you have one life and if you die you convert down into a regular Iron Man forever and your hardcore stats get locked into the hardcore high scores to commemorate what stats you had when you died. There's Ultimate Iron Man, which means along with regular Iron Man restrictions, you also can't use the bank. And there's Group Iron Man, which means you're in a group of two to five group Iron Man total, and you could only trade between each other, and you could do bossing together. What I would recommend is that if you're completely new to OSRS, and you never played in the 2000s or when you were a kid, and everything is all new to you, I'd say you should start as a normal main account and not Iron Man. If you did play back in the day and you're coming back after not having played for years, I'd recommend a regular Iron Man if it sounds interesting to you. As kids, before the Grand Exchange, a lot of us didn't understand the intricacies of flipping and merching and having to communicate with other players to get the items we wanted, so a lot of us kind of did our own thing or maybe had a couple close friends that we traded back and forth with, and I think that kind of self-sufficient mindset would really make you enjoy the game as an Iron Man. I mentioned the Grand Exchange, which is usually shortened to the GE. The GE is where players do their trading. It connects every player across all worlds, and people can leave in their buy and sell offers overnight, so you'll always be able to buy and sell whatever you want, whenever you want, if you're not an Iron Man, of course. There is a 1% tax when you use the GE, but as a new player, it'll barely be noticeable to you. Iron Man cannot sell anything on the GE, but they are able to use the GE to buy only one type of item, and that is bonds. Which leads me into the next topic, what are bonds? A bond gives you 14 days of membership, and just to clarify, normal accounts can buy and sell bonds, but Iron Man can only buy them. Bonds are the only official form of microtransaction in old school RuneScape, since you can buy a bond with real money. The price has slowly gone up over the years, like with most things, but the current price, as I record this video, is 8 US dollars. So you buy the bond with real money, and then you could sell them in-game over the GE to other players, and right now they're going for about 11 mil. Or you could look at it in reverse. You grind out 11 mil GP and you could buy a bond with in-game gold so you don't have to spend real money on membership. But you cannot redeem a bond for real money, only membership. Bonds were very controversial when they came out in 2015 since they are a microtransaction. A lot of people thought it would lead to a slippery slope of more and more MTX like what happened with RuneScape 3. But now, almost 10 years later, it did not lead to a slippery slope and the general consensus for most players is that bonds are an important part of the game. I would highly advise against buying bonds to get in-game gold at the start when you're new. I think it'll really sour the new player experience, and you really don't need a whole lot of GP when you're getting started. Unless you can't afford membership, which we'll get into in a bit. When you're a bit further into the mid-game, maybe you're a busy person in real life and you have the disposable income to buy bonds with real money so you can afford better gear to take on raids and high-level bosses sooner, that's the time to do it, but not now as you're starting out your journey. Next thing we need to talk about is membership. 
Yes, membership is always 100% worth it. Even if you're just starting the game, membership will progress you so much faster. And without it, you're extremely limited on what you can do in the game. If you have the means to get membership, I'd say get it right away. At the moment, it's $12.49 USD if you pay on a month to month basis, or cheaper per month if you buy longer term packages. Or if you're still really unsure about the game, you can buy a bond for $8 for only two weeks of membership. But I do understand that not everyone is in a position to pay for membership with real money, and if that's you, it's not all doom and gloom, I promise. But we need to make a plan for you to get out of free-to-play in a sustainable way so that you can maintain your membership through in-game GP. To save yourself time in members, you can do a bunch of free-to-play quests since you're stuck here anyways, and if you're brand new, then try out a bunch of the skills like woodcutting. You could chop trees, sell the logs on the GE, and buy better axes on the GE as you get higher woodcutting level. Try mining and fishing and cooking and all these skills to understand how they work, and I'll refer you back to the wiki training guides so you can see how to get started with each one. But once you've done this basic stuff, you need a plan with two parts. Part one is making GP for your first bond. Part two is sustaining membership after you get your first bond so that you're never stuck in free-to-play again. To make that GP for your first bond, we're going to go to the money-making page on the wiki. We'll sort it by free-to-play and then by the highest GP per hour and try out a bunch of different methods until you find the one or a few that you like the most. Some people don't mind grinding out one thing all the way, and other people like variety. There's no right or wrong answer, because sometimes the fastest and most efficient moneymaker will make you despise the game, and quitting the game is less GP per hour than anything else on this list. If you want somewhere to start for free-to-play moneymakers, I'd recommend crafting. There's multiple crafting things on this list, and you could start with the lowest requirement one and work your way up from there. And remember, if you're missing level requirements, you can refer to the wiki page for training methods for the skills. If you're making 100 to 200k GP per hour, it's going to take you 50 to 100 hours to be able to earn your first bond. Which is why I say if you have the means, just spend the 8 to $12 for your first bit of membership, and from there you'll be able to sustain yourself with GP if you really want to, because the money making methods as a member are so much better, even with low stats. But if you are earning your bond in free to play, at least if you're doing something like crafting or woodcutting, you're still gaining XP, which means you're progressing your account, so it's not a total waste of time. Due to the nature of the game, this is an important tip by the way, a lot of the time this will be a second monitor game as you watch YouTube, Netflix, or Twitch, or do homework, or browse Reddit. Many, many activities have a lot of idle time, so please don't stare at your character chopping trees for 100 hours. Do whatever you do normally on the computer with the game on the side, because once you get set up doing whatever training method you're doing, it'll hardly feel like you need to pay attention to the game. The next step is how to maintain a bond with GP once you get membership. For every bond, you're spending 11 mil GP, but the price is constantly changing so it'll most likely be different when you're watching this, but let's just say you need to earn 11 mil every 14 days. That's 785k GP per day. Well, guess where we're going? To the money making page on the wiki, but this time we can look through all the members options. Although we are going to need to scroll down pretty far since you won't have a lot of the requirements for the higher GP per hour methods. I'd suggest that you pick methods that progress your skills, because if you're doing a method, for example, where you hop worlds picking up an item, you're not leveling up anything or making any progress on your account. But say you start out with runecrafting nature runes, that's a level 44 runecraft requirement. By the time you've done that for a few hours, eventually you'll unlock a slightly better method like double cosmic runes at level 59 runecraft. Make sure whatever method that you want to look more into that you click on the method and pay close attention to the other recommended stats, gear, quests, and so on, because otherwise you won't be making as much GP as it says. I know it can be overwhelming because you want to do one thing, but first you have to do three other things to be able to do that original thing with more efficiency, and then those three other things each have their own separate requirements but it's just a part of the game that everyone has to go through. Training up stats, questing, playing mini games, and as you do all this, it'll make you a more well-rounded player. So before you activate your first bond, figure out how you're gonna get your second bond. Look into these methods, watch YouTube videos on the methods that you wanna do, see if it's doable for you right away, or if you need to do quests or other things first. Can you do those quests relatively quickly, or do they have too high requirements
and it's too much for you too soon, in which case just pick a different method. I think you'll be able to earn at least 500k per hour once you get into members, so going by that it'll be about 20 hours for your second bond. Maybe you could fit 20 hours of money making in a week or 10 days to afford your second bond. After that, you can spend the rest of the time either earning money for your third bond or doing quests and non-money making stuff to progress your account so you'll be able to do better money makers sooner. If you're not paying gold for membership though, you really don't need to worry about GP in general too much because you'll make a lot by training up your skills and just playing through the game. When you're a low level, sure you're not making millions of GP, but that wouldn't help you anyways because you're not going to be able to use the best gear. And by the time you get to that point where you want to make those expensive upgrades, you'll have way better money makers unlocked and way more GP saved up. That's the bonds and membership section over. Next, we're going to talk about questing. As you get started in the game, you may feel lost on what to do. Questing is the best way to progress your account. By getting quests done, you'll unlock new areas, get XP rewards, and unlock better training methods, which in turn leads to better money making methods. Along with that, most quests have skill requirements, which means you'll have gold to work towards if you were unsure on what you should be doing or what skills you should be training. You really should try to do as many quests as you can as soon as possible because when you get say a 50k or 100k XP reward, the amount of XP helps a lot more when you're like level 70 in a skill than if you were to wait a long time and that skill is already in the 90s because spoiler, the XP between levels scales exponentially as your level gets higher. Level 50 does not mean you're more than halfway to 99. Level 92 means you're halfway to 99. But the next question is, well, what are the best quests to do early on? What order should you do them? Once again, the wiki has the answers. We'll go to the optimal quest guide page and it lists a good order to do the quests in. Now, most people don't care about playing efficiently or don't want to feel obligated to follow a guide. And you don't have to follow this by any means. If anything, I think it's a good way to get ideas of what to do, not that you have to follow it exactly. Little side note, there's a plugin in the plugin hub called WikiSync, and if you install it and turn it on, it'll sync your character to the wiki and update in real time. And it does it for so many pages throughout the wiki, it'll show what things you have or haven't completed, it'll show requirements that you have and what requirements you're missing for all kinds of things all throughout the wiki. Now getting into doing the actual quests, most players use a guide of some sort. You don't have to follow a guide and some people find enjoyment and fulfillment out of figuring out quests on their own. There's no right or wrong way to play the game. I will say though, once you get into the late game quests, without a guide, some of the puzzles can make a quest take 10 plus hours rather than 1-2 to two hours if you were using a guide. But for the early and mid game, not using a guide won't be too much of a detriment in terms of time. If you do want to use quest guides, there's three main types of guides people use. The first, I'm sure you already know what I'm gonna say, is the wiki guides. Search up the quest that you want to do on the wiki and it'll give you full in-depth detailed instructions on what to do, what items you need, and so on. And every quest on the wiki also has a quick guide version if you don't want the lore and explanations of what's going on and you'd rather rush through it to get the rewards faster. The second method is YouTube quest guides. The go-to YouTube channel that nearly everyone uses for quest guides is Slayer Music but you could search around and find whoever you like the best. And the third type of quest guide is a runelite plugin called Quest Helper. It'll highlight characters you need to talk to, show you which dialogue options to click, what items you need for the next step, and it's really everything you could hope for. Make sure the plugin is flipped on and all you have to do is right click the quest you want to do and choose the option to start the quest helper. And you can see when you right click a quest, there's also the option to open the wiki guide or the wiki quick guide. So I'd say try out all three of the methods and find the one that works best for you. A lot of people even use two of these at the same time in case they get stuck on a part, they can have the YouTube video up for example that will show them exactly what to do. Along the lines of questing, the next thing to talk about is diaries. All the diaries are members only, but just like with questing, they give you good goals to work towards because they all have skill requirements and quest requirements. Diaries are just a list of tasks, and they're grouped into certain areas of the game, like there's the Varrock Diary, Falador Diary, and so on and each location has different tiers of task. There's easy, medium, hard, and elite. Once you complete all the tasks in a specific tier of a specific location, you get the reward. Completing diaries unlocks useful items, XP 
coffee lamps, boosts, bonuses. I mean, there's so many perks to doing diaries. The sooner you get them done, the better. If you want to start with one diary to get a feel for them, the Arty Easy Diary has the lowest requirements and anyone can do it on day one of their account. After covering quests and diaries, I think that's a good segue into a very important topic, which is goals. Just like in real life, you also want to have goals in OSRS. Goals are a good way to keep you going and make you feel fulfilled and accomplished when you reach them. Start with coming up with a long-term goal. Long-term is subjective, so maybe to you, long-term means your first 99, or the quest cape, or diary cape, or maxing out your account with all 99s getting a fire cape, getting Bandos armor, reaching 100 million GP. Those are just a few ideas, but only you know what you want out of the game. Once you figure out your long-term goal, set some medium-term goals that you want to reach before getting to your long-term goal. If your long-term goal is the fire cape, for example, then some of your medium-term goals can be to save up a few million GP to buy a blowpipe, get 75 range to equip the blowpipe, and get the void armor from pest control. And from there, you want to set short-term goals. Like you could say, hey, this weekend I want to make 1 million GP, I want to get a few range levels, and I want to get one piece of the void set. By setting these goals, especially the short-term ones, you'll have more motivation to play and feel a sense of accomplishment when you reach them. And in general, I think it's a really uplifting feeling and puts you in a good mood when you reach and even surpass goals that you set for yourself. If you're still lost and don't know what you want out of the game or what goals to set, there is a guide which it's made for Iron Man, but a normal account could use it too. It's called the Osiris Guide, and it's considered one of the best documented efficient routes to reaching Barrow's Gloves, Quest Cape, the City of Prithinos, and getting to the bossing stage in general. The guide originates from a pace bin, but it's a lot easier to read in checklist form on this website, ironman.guide. It'll be linked in the description either way, along with a bunch of other resources I mentioned throughout the video, and maybe even some I didn't. Just like I said about the optimal quest order guide, I know most players don't care about playing efficiently, especially especially new players, but if you don't know what to do, you can skim through the guide to get ideas. Or you can follow along roughly and skip the more tedious steps, like there's a very notorious step that just says, get 88 thieving. You probably don't want to do that, and that's fine. Play the game the way you want to. By having all these resources I've mentioned at your disposal, you'll have plenty of different ideas and opinions coming from all these different sources, and you could form your own conclusion on what you want out of the game based on the culmination of all that information you've been given. Since combat is a huge part of the game, a lot of the goals you have will be based around gear upgrades, and a very notable goal for newer players though is Barrow's Gloves. You get these from completing the Recipe for Disaster quest, which which has a bunch of subquests as a part of it, and then each of those subquests have their own quest and skill requirements. So Barrow's Gloves is a great goal because it can take some time for a new player to get to that point, but it's not unrealistic whatsoever, and you'll get so many quests done and have gained so many levels along the way. Quest Cape is another good goal, you have to complete every quest for it. Diary Cape is kind of a step up from the Quest Cape because you need the Quest Cape for one of the diary tasks, and when you get into the Elite Diaries, most of them have much higher requirements than what you need for any quest. But you can set the goal of going for all the easy diaries first, then go for all the mediums, and so on. The Fighter Torso is a very strong chest plate slot for melee, which doesn't cost GP, but you have to play the Barbarian Assault minigame but it's another item I'd recommend going for once you get maybe to the mid game. An early game item to go for, especially as an Iron Man, would be the Dorgashan Crossbow, aka the Bone Crossbow. You can purchase it after the Lost Tribe quest, and the ammunition bone bolts are extremely cheap. And on the topic of ammo, there's a cape slot item called Ava's Attractor that you get after the Animal Magnetism quest, and this saves you 60% of your ammo. Or if you have at least 50 range, then you can get Ava's Accumulator, which saves you 72% of ammo, and then way later on you'll be able to upgrade it again to save you 80%. If you're a normal account, you can make quite a bit of GP on the side by doing herb runs. That would be a whole separate video in itself, so I'll refer you to YouTube or the wiki if you want more in-depth guides. But basically, you can plant herbs in between whatever activity you're doing and harvest them after 80 minutes. The wiki has a page filled with tons of calculators that automatically update as prices change. So go to the herb farming calculator, and at any given time you can see what the most profitable type of seed is. 
and make sure you always use Ultra Compost to get the best yield. You'll also want the Magic Secateurs, which you get from an early game quest, Fairy Tale Part 1. These will give you an extra 10% yield for your herb runs. And after Fairy Tale Part 1, you can start Part 2, and shortly into that quest, you'll unlock Fairy Rings without even having to complete that quest. This is a transportation method that lets you use any Fairy Ring to teleport to any other one in the game. These are extra important if you're an Iron Man, since you can't just buy teleport tabs from the GE like a normal account could, but even still, there's a lot of locations fairy rings get you to that no other teleports are close to. On the topic of transportation, the graceful outfit is an important set to get. It significantly increases the speed that your run energy restores and makes you way less so that your run drains slower when you're running around. Having a higher agility level helps with this too, by the way. You need 260 marks of grace for the full set, and you get them by doing rooftop agility courses. If you start the Canifus Rooftop course at level 40 agility, it'll take around 15 hours to get all the marks you need, and you'll end at about level 55 agility. Or you can go to the highest level rooftop course you can to get more XP, like at level 50 you can switch to Faldor, and at level 60 you switch to Sears Village. You'll get more XP that way, but slower marks of grace per hour, so it'll take longer before you get graceful. But like with everything in the game, the route you take depends on your goals. Normal accounts can buy stamina potions from the GE, but since they have a high herbler requirement, most Iron Men don't get them until way later on. Stamina Pots give a 70% reduction in run energy depletion for 2 minutes, and while it may seem expensive to a new player, they can help you to make more GP per hour when you're doing certain skilling methods or money makers, which will way more than offset the cost of buying them. Just like with Fairy Rings, Spirit Trees are another form of transportation where you can teleport between any two Spirit Trees, and the quest to unlock them is Tree Gnome Village, which is considered a very early game quest. The Dragon Scimitar, need I say more? Even many people who never played RuneScape still recognize this iconic weapon. It's an important stepping stone for melee before you can use a whip, whether you're an Iron Man or a normal account. And for this, you need the Monkey Madness quest along with 60 attack. Another passive moneymaker for main accounts is unlocking Fossil Island and doing birdhouse runs. I had a mini-series on my channel years ago dedicated to seeing how much GP you can get solely by doing birdhouses. The series is pretty cringe because it was so long ago, but I'll add that to the list of links in the description so you can see how you can do your first birdhouse run. These take 2 minutes to do, you can do them every 50 minutes, 5-0, you make some decent GP, and it trains your hunter level. Although I would suggest just doing them with your herb runs so you're not interrupting your main activity as often. My next tip is to do the Slayer skill, especially if you're an Iron Man. Slayer is going to a Slayer Master, they assign you to kill X amount of a specific monster, and each time you kill that monster that's on your Slayer task, it gives you Slayer XP. It's a very important skill as an Iron Man, since you need to do Slayer to unlock so many gear upgrades. Getting your Slayer level up unlocks the ability to fight more monsters. And generally, the higher the Slayer requirement for a monster, the more GP per hour you can make. Like when you get Slayer into the 90s, you'll easily be averaging 2 mil, 3 mil, or even more GP per hour at high level Slayer bosses. I'd suggest you use the highest level Slayer Master you can, except for the Mount Karulm Slayer Master Konar. When you get to that point, you'll have a better understanding of whether or not to get tasks from her. But other than that, yeah, just use the highest level Slayer Master you can. I don't want to get too deep or over explain any specific one. One thing due to the nature of this video, but I will just mention one item that helps with Slayer, which is the Black Mask. It provides huge combat bonuses when you're fighting monsters for your Slayer task, and you should get it as soon as you have the requirements for it. A common question I get is, how do you make your screen look like that? Go to the panel with the spanner, click the third tab, and from there you can adjust your game client layout. I usually play on fixed, but you can see which one you like the most. A lot of skills have their own minigames, which you'll see when you're looking at the skill training guides on the wiki. Like Firemaking has Winter Toad, Fishing has Temperos, Runecraft has Guardians of the Rift, Smithing has Giant's Foundry, and these minigames all give you items that help you train the respective skill outside the minigame. So generally, it's good to do the skilling minigames to get started with skills. Most of the skilling minigames have an outfit set as a reward, and a lot of these outfits are XP boosting outfits that will give you 2.5% bonus XP for the respective skill. Each of the skill training guides will remind you about the outfits and explain how to get them, but I wanted to make you aware of them as well. Overhead Prayers. At level 37 prayer, you unlock Protect from Magic, 
Level 40 is protect from range, and level 43 is protect from melee. Whether you're playing a normal account or an Iron Man, getting 43 prayer is very important because it means you could take zero damage from monsters if you use the correct overhead prayer. There are some monsters that can hit through prayer, but you don't need to worry about those anytime soon. Don't waste your time going for 43 prayer in free to play. Once you get to members, save up a bit of GP and buy dragon bones, and then you could use the Wildy Altar or a Gilded Altar. Again, on the wiki training guides, there are in-depth guides for both the methods. I'll always recommend the Wildy Altar over a Gilded Altar because it doubles your bones, so even if you get PK'd every other trip and lose all your bones each time, you're still coming out on top. But especially if you're only like level 10 or 20, almost all the PKers there will be too high of a level to attack you anyways. Going from level 1 to 43 will only take about 100 dragon bones at the Wildy Altar. The construction skill is very important because of all the things you could build in your player-owned house, or POH for short. You can build a spirit tree, a fairy ring, a nexus to hold a bunch of teleports, a healing pool that restores your health, prayer, and everything else, a jewelry box for even more teleports, a costume room to store items, and so, so much more that would just take too long to go over. Since this is an early game guide and construction is a relatively expensive skill, you don't need to worry about training it right away, but it's something to keep in mind for the future that the POH is like your central hub for most activities you're going to do. If you're not an Iron Man, you could hang out in World 330, which is the house party world, and use other people's maxed out houses, but because there's so many people on the world all the time, it's always really laggy, and it also adds extra steps if you're doing an activity that requires a lot of teleporting home, so in the end, it's best to not have to rely on other people. I know this is a lot, and it can be overwhelming for a new player, and what happens to a lot of people is they freeze. It's kind of ironic, like there's so many things you want to do that you end up doing nothing because your mind is going all over the place. And if this happens to you, just grab your axe and start woodcutting or do any training method you already know how to do while you figure out your next plan of action. Because an hour later, when you're still watching guides, you'll be like, wow, I'm glad I was doing something and got an extra 40k woodcutting XP or an extra 200k GP or whatever amount of progress you gained with whatever you were doing. The final topic of this video is about the community. The RuneScape player base is very interesting because the average age of players has grown with the game. Looking at my YouTube analytics from 2016-2017, you can see more than half of OSR's viewers were in the age group of 18 to 24. Now, five to six years later, here's my current audience demographics. Isn't that so interesting? Now, the vast majority of OSR's viewers are in the 25 to 34 age group. The player base is a lot more mature than in 2007. You're not playing with 12-year-olds anymore, although there is a good chance that you're playing with the same people that you played with in 2007 since those 12 year olds are now 25 to 34. In 2016, the average OSRs player was a college kid or a struggling bachelor living alone in a small apartment. Compared to now, in 2024, the average player is a 30 year old man with a wife and a small child. We've come so far, man. But something I love about OSRs is that I think the nostalgia brings out the childhood in us. And the grown-ass 30-year-old man with a family will make 69 jokes in the public chat and meme and troll just like when we were kids. Anyways, I went off on a bit of a tangent there. Where I was going with that is that as the average player age has grown and as the internet has matured as well over the years, the community, in my opinion, is the most important aspect of OSRS. If you never got to interact with anyone and it was truly a single-player game, would it really be as fun as it is? When there's other players, you're able to brag and show off your accomplishments. I know the first thing you're gonna do when you get your fire cape. You're gonna teleport to the GE and look down at all the noobs wearing obsidian capes and arty cloaks. But at the same time, seeing other players also makes you jealous of their accomplishments, which then gives you the motivation and drive to do those things because you wanna be like them. Doing raids and bossing with other players, especially in a Discord call, are some of the best memories I've ever made in this game. So many clans do a events together like skill of the week or bingos where you're grouped into a team for a week or two and you compete against other teams to gain more XP or get certain items before they do. There's so much fun to be had and so many friends to be made that it's hard to comprehend until you're actually involved in the OSRS community. So the question is, how can you become a part of it? I think the best way is by joining Discord servers. 
but where do you find the servers? The easiest way, in my opinion, is by watching OSRS YouTubers. Figure out what kind of videos you like best. Maybe you like Iron Man progress videos, or you like peaking, or you like top 10 lists. Spend a while watching OSRS YouTube until it takes over your YouTube algorithm. Eventually, you'll find YouTubers that you have a parasocial connection with based on their personalities and join their Discord servers. Because odds are, the people that felt that inclined to go out of the way to join that YouTuber's server also have a similar personality and they're people you'll get along with. Maybe lurk for a while, then type a bit in their Discord servers. You could send pictures of your accomplishments and people will grats you. And a lot of YouTubers also have clans that are closely connected with their Discords. So if you get really close with members of a specific community, you could join their clan and boom, now you're in baby. I'm not saying this as a way to be like, oh yeah, join my Discord server. Just find any YouTuber you like or YouTubers that you like. And I genuinely think that making OSRS friends will change your life for the better and give you more things to look forward to in life. It's so fun, man. Like imagine being in a call with a few others and a couple people are screen sharing and you're screen sharing yourself fighting a boss and then you get the drop you were looking for and everyone's screaming along with you as you get it. It's such a good time. I've had people that met for my streams that ended up becoming roommates. I've seen plenty of people become close friends through Discord and meet up for drinks and hanging out. I've seen a bunch of close friendships form. A lot of people, myself included, have even met their partners through RuneScape. It really is like a butterfly effect. These small decisions that you make can have huge ripple effects for your life going forward, and the majority of the time it's for the better. Besides joining discords, another social media you can use to get involved and stay up to date with things is Reddit. You can browse the r slash 2007scape subreddit, that's kind of the main one, and if you're interested in Iron Man, you can check out the r slash ironscape subreddit. You can make a Twitter account and follow your favorite favorite YouTubers and streamers on there and also the people that you met in the discords or clan if you joined any. Another really big one is Twitch. Watching and typing in streams is seriously an amazing way to meet people. Obviously if it's a big streamer with a thousand viewers it'll be tough to make a close-knit group of friends but if you find streamers with less viewers, it's a lot easier to make personal connections with other viewers in the stream. I bet if you go into almost any streamer's chat with under 20 viewers, they'd be so happy and appreciative to have you there and making conversation. Like you could tell them you're new to the game and ask for advice. Like you could say if there's anything they wish they knew when they started the game, and you could ask when they started, and it's so easy to make conversation from there. Crazy, right? Who would have thought that having the same interests could lead to conversations and friendships? Since I'm on the topic of social media, it's a good time to mention there are a lot of phishing links and scams. It's extremely common to see view botted streams on Twitch that say, hey, there's double XP, just use this link to log into the forums. Or people spam at the GE saying, go watch their YouTube video because they're giving away all their GP. And you go to the video and it tells you to use the link in the description to log in. Again, they're just gonna hack you. There is no double XP in old school and there's no giveaways that make you log into the forums to enter. Be extremely diligent before clicking any links and definitely don't enter your OSRS info anywhere besides to log into the launcher or to log into the website. But don't ever go to the OSRS website through another link, enter in the actual URL yourself. Also, you will never ever have to enter your bank pin anywhere besides in-game to access your bank. So if you get a message anywhere saying you need to enter your bank pin to log in, that's a phishing link. Your bank pin has nothing to do with your Jagex account or login information. Now going back to the whole stuck in free to play thing, if you make some good friends in any of these communities, Odds are, they might help you out with a bond. Do not by any means make friends with the secret hope or expectation of trying to get free stuff, but I'm just saying I've seen it happen so often where someone will talk about how they've spent all week crafting in free to play to earn their way into members and someone will just straight up offer them a bond. The player base is more mature and in general way more empathetic than they were 15 years ago. There's always some bad eggs when you have a large enough sample size and if you do come across bad people, please don't let it sour your taste of the general OSRS community. Keep in mind that a lot of vocal people that you'll see on social media have strong opinions one way or another about the game, but most players don't take it that serious. It's like when you see Yelp reviews, the people that make the reviews are generally the people that had bad experiences, otherwise they wouldn't be commenting in the first place. It's like you'll see the place with 4.9 stars or the, the item on Amazon with 4.9 stars, but there's always a few angry reviews and you could tell they're just angry people in general. There's always exceptions of course because things do go wrong sometimes. 
So maybe that's a bad comparison, but the point I'm trying to make is that there's always that side of the community in any game, and don't let others try to bring you down and make you feel bad for having fun and enjoying the game. But seriously, consider joining some Discord servers and see where it takes you from there. I think you'll enjoy the game more than you ever thought you would. If you want somewhere to start with watching OSRS videos, this is where I'm going to plug my channel. I mainly make progress videos, and I've logged my adventures playing through a normal account, Hardcore Iron Man, Ultimate Iron Man, and currently I'm playing a duo group Iron Man that's pretty far into the late game. If you're new to OSRS, I think it helps to follow along someone else's journey because you'll really get a feel for what to expect in terms of progression throughout different stages of the game, and you learn a lot more specific tips and pieces of info by watching progress videos rather than watching a general new player's guide that's a lot of superficial and general info about the game condensed into one video. So feel free to browse through my playlist and I'd appreciate it if you checked out my other videos and gave them a chance. Because there's so much to cover on a topic like this, there's a good chance I forgot to mention some things, so make sure to check out the description in case I have to edit anything in, or maybe it'll be a pinned comment, I'm not sure. And all the other important links and resources I mentioned throughout the video will be in the description as well. There's so many more beginner guides on YouTube, so I would suggest you check out other people's starting guides too. It's always good to hear multiple different opinions and ideas and hear out the reasonings for why people think you should or shouldn't do certain things. Especially if you think my video sucked, then instead of writing a comment about how bad the video was, which won't accomplish anything, my proposal would be to go watch someone else's video. I've been doing this for over seven years and the duality of man shines bright on every single guide I've ever made. That's pretty crazy if you made it all the way through to the end, because this was a pretty long video. Unless you cheated and skipped to the end but then you care enough to still be listening to me right now. So yeah, love you, bye.